Hi everyone, my name is Andy Wheelock and this is the OETC, the Ohio Educational Technology Conference uh, interview series and I'm interviewing to start off with some of the featured presenters uh, at the conference and with me today I have Therese Wilcombe, a PhD and Therese is the Director of New Hampshire's State Assistive Technology Program with the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire. UNH and is an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy. And what's more, she's doing a lot as she is known as the MacGyver of assistive technology and has designed and fabricated thousands of solutions for individuals with disabilities, including her patented AT pad stand, uh, which is a multi-use multi-use assistive technology mounting device. And what's more, uh, she's known throughout the country for doing uh, really awesome, uh, awesome trainings on uh, iPad apps and adaptations. And if that wasn't enough, <laughs> you have 22 assistive, written 22 assistive technology related publications, including your new book titled Assistive Technology Solutions in Minutes, book two. So, uh, and you've also been on CNN, RFD TV, and recently NPR Science Friday, wow. Uh, Therese, you have a, a wonderful uh, resume, but it sounds like a resume of, of real help and support and education, which is, sounds very powerful. Can you tell us right off the bat, first of all, welcome, and second of all, can you tell us that journey of, of how you got to where you are? Because I think your, your career and your titles are very unique, innovative, and, uh, and fascinating. Ah. Well, well, thank you. So. So my journey, um, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, technology and education. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and um, we all farmed and uh, growing up in Wisconsin, um, being diagnosed with uh, really two different disabilities. One is a learning disability and the other is uh, Tourette's. And so growing up in Wisconsin and um, all the, the, the particular testing and everything, um, there was what we, we call as low expectations. And in the various um, special education rooms, resource rooms, um, I, along with lots of other um, struggling learners, uh, got very bored or frustrated. And, and I remember sitting in the back of the classroom and really not paying attention at all, but I became involved with paper clips and scotch tape and began to obsess about paper clips and scotch tape and began to create all of these things with paper clips and scotch tape. And little did I know later on I'd have a career where I'm doing paper, tip, paper clips and scotch tape. But anyways, I certainly was not uh, college material and I scored like in the bottom uh, one percentile on the college tests. And, but my guidance counselor said that the factories were hiring and I could certainly get a job there. Uh, I could also milk cows and uh, work at the restaurants. So I did all three. And one day my English teacher was getting gasoline in her car. I was getting gas in my car and she told me that I could go to college. And I said, oh no, I can't go to college. You have to be able to read and write when you go to college. And, you know, I can't read and write. How am I ever going to do that in college? And she went to one of these professional development workshops that talked about students with disabilities going to college and these support services for students with disabilities. And she told me that I could get all of my books on tape, that I could take all my tests orally, that um, perhaps in place of writing papers, I could do special projects. Um, so... She advocated for me, and I went to the University of Wisconsin Stout and got my bachelor's degree in vocational rehabilitation, and then also bachelor's degree in special education. Um, my real uh, passion was in designing and fabricating things for people with disabilities. I wanted to get a degree in, in rehabilitation engineering, but of course, there's a lot of math in engineering, and wasn't too keen on the math piece. Um, so, but I went on and got my, my master's um, in vocational rehabilitation, but I did more, more like a, a minor in like mechanical engineering, material sciences, where 
I could learn about more of tools and materials for building things. Um, and after um, a few years of, I was working in a couple of different programs, traveling around the state of Iowa, um, working for Easter Seals at the time and creating lots of solutions for the home, for um, agricultural producers. Um, then I started getting questions about schools and about how do we adapt things in the schools also to support uh, students with disabilities. When I got my PhD in rehabilitation science and technology from the University of Pittsburgh, and then something uh, interesting happened in, uh, I eventually ended up in, in New Hampshire and I was the director of the largest assistive technology provider. And in the schools, there was this huge waiting list of students who were experiencing a variety of disabilities who were waiting for an assistive technology consult. And they waited months and sometimes they would wait six months before they'd ever get a device and even if they got a device to help them to succeed in the educational curriculum, didn't mean that it was going to work. As a matter of fact, 90% of the time, the devices that were just given to someone didn't work. Um, they had to be tweaked, adapted, mounted, you know, supported. And one of the things I discovered by, you know, growing up in a rural area and uh, my family farming and uh, you learn very quickly two things. One is how to make do with what you have. Um, the other is a sense of urgency about get it done today. All the things you could do with duct tape and bailing wire. And if the cows get out, you got to get the cows back in. And uh, so learning about the fact that in education and particularly students with disabilities, there needs to be a sense of urgency. There needs to be that let's get in there. Let's figure it out. And if we know that 90% of the time, the things that we try are not necessarily gonna be perfect, they're not necessarily going to work, then we can figure out rapid solution development, um, rapid solution deployment, and a way to do trial and error, the way to come up with solutions in five minutes or less, for $5 or less, um, to demystify this whole thing about technology. We think technology is always about an iPad or a computer, and that's not necessarily true. And so I remember this one district, we jumped in and we went in and uh, rolled all the stuff in and I had the kids involved in building stuff. I had the teachers involved in building stuff. At the end of the day, we fabricated about 30 different solutions for these students. And every time we created something, if it didn't work, we would change it, we would adapt it, we'd add a piece to it, we would remount it. And then we would take a picture demonstrating the student being able to perform a particular activity might be in activities as simple as being able to turn a page independently or being able to do a switch for choices to be able to communicate, something simple. And the, I remember the special ed coordinator was like, wow, that was really fast. Look at what you accomplished in one day. And, and the sense of we need to do more of that. We need to uh, figure out a way of um, rapid solution development. And then in 2007, uh, somebody started calling me the uh, MacGyver. And then I said, no, I'm a MacGyver or a MacGyvette <laughs> for uh, creating solutions on the fly. And, and so teaching people on how they can all be MacGyvers, MacGyvas, or MacGyvettes and looking around the classroom in creative ways and, and coming up with solutions, you know, very, very quickly. Um, I get paid for playing and... Uh, I get calls from all over the world who ask me, oh, they have a particular student that needs this. Do you have any thoughts, any ideas, any? And so um, as I get older, I'm more concerned about our environment. I'm concerned about waste, about how we throw things away or we stick things in closets not being used. So I'm very particular about materials that I select for creating solutions in minutes. These materials have to be reusable, they have to be non-toxic, um, biodegradable, um, repositional, readjustable, because everybody's needs are different. In the regular field of engineering, products are designed and tested for many years before they're ever released to the public. But in assistive technology, particularly children with uh, complex needs, 
you're developing a solution, a one a kind, one of a kind type of solution for one of a kind type of need. The fact that it may fail, of course, that's really high. But to throw that out there to say, you know what, let's give this a shot. We're not sure if it's going to work, but that's okay. We're going. To, we're that much closer to coming up with a solution that will work. We're going to just keep try another way, try another way. So it's been a just a really great uh, journey through this whole process. A couple things stood out to me as, as you talked about your journey. And first of all, it seems like your professional, uh, I guess, end result has been really the result of a pers of your personal um, experiences. Do you find your personal experiences, you know, help you to, I guess, in your teaching and relating to, to students? Yes, you know, those personal experiences, this whole thing about reading and writing, um, my introduction to assistive technology was my first semester where I received books on tape, right? And I took all the tests orally. Um, I came up with a particular technique of note-taking back then. Uh, it, you know, they used to say, oh, bring a recorder to class, record all these lectures. No, because, I mean, you bring a recorder to class, you record all the lectures. First of all, if you missed the first time, you're going to miss it the second time. Secondly, who has all that time to go back and play all those tapes? There's only so many hours in the day. So the technique I came up with is what I call the tap-tap technique. So I take a recorder. I record the lecture. I hit it record. I have a pen in my hand. And let's say it's a statistics course or a math course, or let's say it's I'm in a situation where all of a sudden I find myself, I'm staring out the window, and somebody says, oh, this is important. This is going to be on a test. You should know this. Anytime there was a concept or something being covered in the classroom that I thought, oh, my gosh, this is really important, or, uh-oh, I don't, I don't even know what you talked about here. I take my pen, and I tap twice next to the microphone on the recorder, or I tap twice on the desk next to the microphone. Then at the end of the day, I'd take those cassettes and I would pop them into the machine. We had a talking book machine that we got from recording for the blind and dyslexic. And then I'd put it on fast speed and that tape would go Every time there would be a I would stop it and I would only play that section. Well, now we've got, you know, we've got the live scribe pen, right, to be able to go back to those parts of the lecture to replay only those sections of the lecture. We've got audio note app that allows us to do that, too. But uh, back in the day, that was really a, a fast, low-tech way of zooming in to be able to do that whole uh, note-taking. So technology, you know, has, has really come a long way. You know, you had mentioned at the beginning about, you know, the assistive technology solutions in Minutes book too, right? So we think that when we write a book that we sit down in front of a computer perhaps and we type or that we sit with a pen and paper and that we write a book that way. No, that book, 100% of that book that I wrote was, doesn't exist on a computer. 100% of that book was written with the iPad um, using the virtual key or the virtual microphone in the keyboard and using the app called Pages that Apple has. And so what I would do is I take the camera and I take a picture of something that I invented, right? And then I take a picture of all the tools and materials. I used a template called recipes that Pages had. And then I'd hit that virtual microphone and I'd say, the tools and materials needed for this project are yada, yada, yada. And then I would go, Step one, do this. Step two, so I used voice recognition. And um, then all I would do is export it as a PDF to the printer. The printer, the, the company, they just put the page numbers in and printed the book. So that entire book was just done on an iPad, and it was done very quickly. So when we look at assistive technology, I mean, that's one of the greatest things that's been that built-in microphone, in my opinion, on the iPad. That was a game changer when the iPad 3 came out. Um, but I look at it, you know, when we look at universal design for learning, universal you know, technology, that built-in microphone not only helps people with print disabilities, but I think that helps everyone and the fact that you can produce a book, a document, very, very quickly. 
um, is is really incredible, and it helps the level of playing um, for all individuals to be able to communicate in a written format, other than using a pen and paper and a computer keyboard. You know, one of the other thoughts that that have crossed my mind is, as you've talked, there's a couple other, I guess, authors or um, you know, featured speakers that I've thought of, and one of them is Ken. Sir Ken Robinson, um, and he talks a lot about schools should not so much focus on you know kind of a one size fits all kind of testing uh, you know regimen, but more along the lines of of schools should explore students' abilities. And you know, when I heard your original story of, of you as a kid and being able to build things out of all sorts of things, that's a talent that probably doesn't get you know really any play in most schools. Should schools, do you think, and maybe this is tapping into my question later on, but should schools maybe focus more on developing talents um, <clears throat> to... You know, yeah, so this whole thing about standardized testing. Um, the problem with standardized testing is, is that you, you use those test results and you pigeonhole, you place people in different categories based upon how they perform on a standardized test. And for many individuals with disabilities, they don't necessarily perform well on standardized tests. I think that we put too much time and energy into and direction towards standardized testing um, versus, you know, you look at Gardner's intelligence theory, you look at um, how um, asking people to be able to share how do they best learn, how do they best demonstrate their skills and their acquisition of knowledge. Give you a point here in terms of schools. Um, I teach, of course, higher in higher education. Um, I was teaching two years ago this online course for graduate students. It's a four credit course. And in this course, it was called um, iPads and Young Children with Disabilities. And I said to all the students, uh, none of you are allowed to use a computer for this class. You are not allowed to do any typing. Um, you're not allowed to do any reading whatsoever for this class. You have to demonstrate skill acquisition in another way, and you will have to learn the information in another way. With You are not allowed to do any reading or writing in this class. So, because it was iPads, everybody had to use an iPad for the class. Um, to demonstrate iPad literacy, there was activities that they had to do in settings. They had to change settings, they had to create keyboard shortcuts, all of that. So they did screenshots. They did screenshots to demonstrate to me as the professor that they mastered that skill and then they put that up. When they had to demonstrate um, how does a particular app help this child with low vision, they did a video clip that showed how they're using the app. That's demonstrating skill acquisition. Um, I put up probably about 150 how-to video clips or demonstrations on you know, how this app works or that app works. And so that's the part about you're watching, you're viewing, you're not reading, and you're seeing in real life children using the different apps and using the technology to succeed in the classroom. Uh, so it's, it was... Uh, it, the interesting thing was I was trying to prove a point that learning can take place and performance can take place without ever reading, writing, or typing. Uh, but the interesting thing ha happened at the end of the class. Um, we had lots of interactive discussions, you know, uh, distance ed. But one of the students said that I really was not using universal design for learning concepts because if I was, I would let students read and write. And so, yeah, they got a point there. <laughs> but I think that we need to embrace all ways of information that can be, be presented. The interesting thing for a while, this whole thing about a flipped classroom, right? You know, we tell students, now make sure that you know all this material because when you come to class, we're going to apply it. What happens in the college environment? These students, these books are really expensive. Um, half the time, my experience is many of the students don't read that. So how do we hold them accountable? How do we really use flip classroom? Because there's no guarantee that they're going to read the work. So there's some really interesting books that are out there for learning um, or for teaching and doing this concept of team teaching and of um, students working together as teams. So first we can assess 
uh, before we get into applying the knowledge is uh, give them a little quiz to assess, did they read it? Do they understand it? Do they know it? Then after that, then they break up into groups of, of you know, three or four. And now as a team, they have to work on those questions together. And so they're graded on both of those. On how, and so the other part is about dialoguing. I think we've gone too far with text messaging, um, emails, uh, typing, and less face-to-face -face with others. And how do we negotiate? How do we work those things out? How do we listen to what other thoughts people bring to the table? So in terms of the iPad, okay, so it's interesting that the latest thing, if you look at the sales on the iPad is, uh, I guess, decreasing. Um, I think that the iPad, is a phenomenal learning tool. It's a multimedia tool, which can engage kinesthetic learning. If you're tapping on the screen, you're moving things over, you're using gestures, um, auditory, visual. So you have this kind of multimodal um, learning. Research just does show that students do succeed in multimodal learning. And so if we look at it as just one of many tools, for um, presenting or learning information. Um, it's a convenience tool. When you think about a computer, you've got to boot up the computer, you've got to log on, you have to put in all this information. It's big and bulky. Um, tablets are coming down in size. The iPad we like because instant on, instant access to the world of information. Um, what's happening now is you look at Google and all of the Google apps that are out there and the free apps. Uh, learning is really changing and this whole embracing of multimedia helps everyone. However, Apple and many companies promote that their technology, that their tablet computers are these be beautiful universally designed tools that are going to help uh, students with disabilities. You have to think about students with significant disabilities, no way. Many of the students, from the standpoint of physical access, um, who can't even hold a tablet, who can't even swipe you know, the tablet, there's always going to be a need for assistive technology to interact with the tablets, with this universal design um, uh, principles. And so, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about multi-holding devices, supporting devices. From an ergonomic standpoint, we talk about match the tool to the person, not the person matching to the tool. So some, some kids can't even get up underneath the desk to interact with the iPad or even these whiteboards that are, you know, you have to go all the way up to the front of the classroom on the whiteboard. Um, and so looking at i've got devices now and um, solutions and systems that i've created that it's a cantilever kind of thing bringing the device to the child no matter if they're in a sit you know tilt and recline chair or they're in bed they're laying down overhead that you can position that device or if their body is like this you can position the device there you don't have to think about learning as sitting at a table or sitting at a desk there's various ways that you can bring in you know, information. So it's, it's really, really quite um, an interesting time, uh, fascinating time. This whole thing with virtual participation. Uh, we do some really creative things where we take a bicycle helmet and bicycle helmets have these vents, right? And if you take one of these industrial twist ties and you put it inside the helmet, right through the vent, and you take a cell phone and you mount it on top of the bicycle and you twist the industrial twist tie. The crown of your head is the most stable. And now you turn on FaceTime. And let's say you have a child that's in the hospital who wants to see what's happening with the science lab activity. Or maybe they want to go on a bicycle ride or something. This whole virtual participation using FaceTime. Or, you know, you and I are using Google Hangouts, right? And Google Hangouts, what, you can connect maybe 10, maybe more. Uh, there's now Zoom and go to meeting. There's lots of ways that learning can take place um, virtually. I think also is that we have to be careful about using the digital media in the sense of um, an iPad with a flat screen. Um, we look at in terms of even in engineering, 
we've gone away with what do we do with our shops we we get rid of our drill press our table saw because we do this modeling on the computer that's really dangerous we have to recognize that learning by doing learning with our hands trial and error is still really important um, there's some new apps that are out that have manipulatives that you work with the manipulatives as you view the objects whatever on the screen so getting back to that the other part about the iPad you know if, if you happen to be blind well the majority of things that are on that iPad is not text-based information it's pictures right it's visual and you're supposed to tap on a particular icon so I've created a way of making tactile graphic overlays that quickly attach to the glass on the iPad and to have the images raise up so you can feel, oh, there's a ball, there's what, oh, I'm supposed to say at the ball. And so thinking innovatively, thinking a little bit, you know, outside the box. Um, another class that I taught online, it's the first class ever on um, a, a fabrication class. Every student gets a box of stuff, and this is through uh, Perkins eLearning, and to prove that you can do hands-on teaching online. So um, everybody gets shipped this box that has all the tools and materials that they're gonna be using, and they fabricate 30 different um, assistive technology solutions for their students who happen to have multiple disabilities, blind, low vision, and it's really quite fascinating. And so, of course, they have to take pictures of what they fabricated, um, how they've used it, and then send the pictures back. So, uh, and, and then they watch all of these how-to videos that go correspond with the little kits that are in the box that they have to build. So I think that that's really important. I also think that students need to learn that failure is okay and that you should fail often. We have such a problem these days. We, we don't want, you know, this whole thing about grade inflation. Everybody feels like that they deserve an A, that they should have an A. And how do we challenge students to even A students? They need to be challenged. They need to be look at, okay, well, you're getting closer. You're getting closer. Um, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's, let's try it this way next time. Let's try it that way. So uh, the classroom is very, very interesting these days with the expectations of students, um, also the integration of the technology, also teachers. Um, younger teachers, of course, embrace the technology because they grew up with it. Um, older teachers are like, oh, is it going to take me more time to learn it? Is it going to be more difficult? Um, our university uh, just switched over to this Canvas platform. Holy cow, it's like been so awesome. It makes my job as a professor easier. It allows me to do many more innovative things that I could have never have done before in any online or even in face-to-face. -face. And so we're living in an, in an exciting time with, with technology. You've answered a lot of my questions and really great stuff. I could, I could listen to this for quite some time. Um, I want to just touch base about your presentations at the OATC conference. If I can just read them off here for those going to the conference. Uh, on Tuesday, you, at, from 2 to 5, you're going to do a make and take workshop called Creating Reading and Writing Solutions in Minutes for Students with Disabilities. And then your other presentation, I believe this is going to be more of a formal presentation, and that's um, from 1 to 2, <clears throat> excuse me, on Wednesday, February 10th. And that is going to be called 101 Solutions for Easier Living, Learning, and Working. Um, in a nutshell, can you give us a little bit of a teaser for those two presentations? Yes, the uh, reading and writing one. I'm, I'm really excited about that. That is going to be so cool, so much fun. Um, we are going to be using corrugated plastic. And you know, it's an election year, and what are all these signs made out of? Corrugated plastic. It's going to be a bumper crop year. Um, and teaching people so, see corrugated plastic to me is like origami right if you score it this way and bend it this way this way you, you create all these solutions so one of the solutions that everybody's going to create is a simple book holder right so so this book holder to be able to bring the book up to make it easier because a lot of people get so exhausted they're bending over trying to read okay so we make a book holder but if we take that book holder and we turn it 90 degrees on its side 
It now becomes a scan and read station using an app called Text Grabber. That now you can put your iPad on it. And the magic thing is 12 inches. You have to be 12 inches from your paper. Your camera can't move. Your paper can't move. And how this portable scan and read station that converts any paper document into an audio um, file, so it scans it and it reads it out loud to the student, going to benefit students with learning disabilities, students with print disabilities, vision impairments. So that's really cool. We're going to make a scan and read station. We're going to make a pocket Eileen. It's a portable iPad holder that you can stick in your pocket, your backpack, your purse, whatever, carry it with you and pop up the iPad and also change the angle on it to make it easier. We're going to be making a couple of different writing aids. Like a lot of times people might have a hard time holding on to things, gripping on. And so how do we do that? How do we wrap that around um, a particular pen? How do we use stuff like Instamorph? How do we adapt styluses for, for students with significant disabilities for writing? We're also going to talk about reading and writing, and, and I'm going to bring a ton of hands-on stuff of looking at how do we suspend things, like people who, you know, you look at people with significant disabilities and how many hours per day do they st spend staring at the ceiling? And how do you create a visual rich environment? How do you teach, you know, reading or a, a book or, you know, an alphabet? And these books are all different. Some are chunky books like early childhood ed. They all have, and they're, they're switching out books constantly. And how do you create a system where a book can quickly slide in um, for a child that has a significant disability, can't turn the pages? Um, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, like I was talking about alternatives to writing using your voice, you know, for writing and what's out there for that. So it's going to be a really interesting, hands-on, interactive. Um, people are going to be making uh, five things, even also like a document holder of, of now how do you read books um, with that, or not read books, read papers, that you can uh, prop up a document. So that's that particular, that hands-on fabrication and learning about um, making technologies for reading and writing. Okay. Then the next one that I'm the keynote speaker on 101 Solutions for Easier Living, Learning, and Working, uh, that one is really kind of fun. Uh, Again, that's going to be kind of hands-on. I'm going to pull out maybe 50, 60 different items that, uh, um, you know, you'll never think, you'll never look at a Swiffer duster the same way again, um, or um, hot dog tongs, or lock lift rug gripper tape that you get in the housewares department. Do you know that there's 62 things you can make with a roll of lock lift rug gripper tape? It's got this bees waxy material on it. It's like a double-sided tape, but it leaves no residue behind. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of things that you can do with that. Um, working, you know, we really need to think about these kids are going to graduate from school and where are they going to go? Um, and so about employment and about how do we create uh, jigs and fixtures, life skills, how does somebody be independent in living in a house and, and caring for themselves? And you know, again, what are things looking around our environment and uh, uh, a cherry pitter, what you can do with a cherry pitter. Um, so, so, and oh, flagpole brackets. I became obsessed with flagpole brackets a, a few years back and created about 22 different solutions you can make with flagpole brackets. Um, students with attention deficit disorders, what you can do with these spring-loaded picnic table clamps. So we're going to have those and showing you creative things you can do with a picnic table client. Uh, it's, it's going to be really fun. Uh, I think it's, it's entertaining. It's going to be really fast because I only have an hour to, to go through all of that. But, but it, it'll be great. So in other words, uh, after election season, save those uh, campaign signs, right? Yes, and people should start contacting people who are running for office. Like when you drive down the street and you see a corrugated plastic sign, find out, put, write down their name or whatever, give their staffers a call, say, hey, you know, we work in a school or we work for a nonprofit organization. Uh, we make things for people with disabilities, uh, you know, consider donating them. But you know, this Eileen, this iPad holder and this book holder, it benefits everyone, not just some, not just a student that happens to have a disability. Librarians love these. They have them on shelves. They're, you know, inexpensive, you can stack them up. Um, they're collapsible, bendable, portable. Uh, 
Yeah, so corrugated plastic, that's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's time for our uh, Speed Geek questions. So you get three quick questions. So they're meant to be uh, light and lively. Let me see if I can share this out here. Uh, let me see if I can make that a little bigger. There we go. Uh, I'm hoping to... There we go. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So here we go. Just uh, again, they can be light, lively, and you get three of them. So here is the first one. Uh, your favorite tablet? I think I know the answer to this. Yeah, iPad. <laughs> okay. Fair <laughs> enough. And it, it looks like you're doing wonders with it. Okay, number two is favorite educational blog. This is a tough one, I think. Um, well, when I think about um, it's one stop for uh, special needs. It's a phenomenal website that is the mother load of everything you can imagine from um, apps to technology for students with special needs. Um, it's the one-stop shop, so I, I, I love that. Um, okay. Can you say that again? One stop, one stop for special needs. Is that the website? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that sounds like a good one. I haven't seen that one. So I'll, I'll share that out with the okay. description of this. And your last one: Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, Star Wars, definitely. <laughs> okay. Have you seen the latest? Absolutely. Okay. Would you give it a thumbs up? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, that is our uh, session for today, and thank you so much. I'm uh, really impressed. I'm really looking forward to meeting you at the conference. Great. And, uh, you'll stop by and say hello to me. I should be around the conference hall, and uh, I, I can't wait to see your, your presentation. It's going to be uh, a really wonderful show. All right. Well, thanks, Andy. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now.